Good evening. I'm Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And I'm delighted to welcome you here tonight to tonight's lecture, which is part of the Labor, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. And it's the first spring 2021 Landmark Lecture of the season. And we would like to thank all of you attending this evening for your support of this lecture. We are pleased to present this series of landmark lectures in partnership with the New York Landmarks Conservancy. And I'd like to express our appreciation for their help and support. For those of you who might be less familiar with the General Society, um, a brief introduction. The General Society and Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of New York City. Today, our 236 year old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of the city of New York through our various educational and cultural programs. These include our tuition free mechanics institute, our John M. Mossman Lock Collection, um, our General Society Library, and our lecture seer, series, um, which is, will soon be nearly 200 years old, and of course, of which is, for, is part of tonight. At the conclusion of tonight's talk, there'll be a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Please feel free um, to type submitted questions at any point through the lecture and of course at the conclusion of the lecture. And we ask that you submit questions through the Q&A section rather than raise your hands. And we of course will try to answer as many questions as possible. To introduce our speaker and to launch the 2021 Landmark Lecture Series this evening, I'm so pleased to introduce the curator for the series, Lisa Easton, a partner in the New York City based architecture and historic preservation firm, Easton Architects. Now, this is now the eighth landmark lecture series that Lisa has curated for the General Society. And I know that once more, Lisa will have selected some absolutely wonderful speakers to talk about landmarks, starting with Don Friedman tonight. It is now my great pleasure to introduce to you, Lisa Easton. Thank you, Karen. Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Over the past year, I've taken the opportunity to look at my community and the places familiar to me and really look at look and listen at what makes them so special, familiar, interesting, and tangible. The built environment is rich by the combination and coexistence of the new and the old, the exemplary and the ordinary, the riches of success, and the struggles of poverty. Preservation provides the opportunity to listen and learn from the stories told by the buildings and the generations who have built and occupied them, which informs the sense of place that surrounds us. Herbert Mouchamp once said, a building does not have to be an important work of architecture to become a first rate landmark. Landmarks are not created by architects. They are fashioned by those who encounter them after they are built. The essential feature of a landmark is not in its design, but the place it holds in a city's memory. Compared to the place it occupies in social history, a landmark's artistic qualities are incidental. I'm honored to be a part of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen 2021 Labor, Literature, and Landmark Lecture Series. Over the past eight years of curating this lecture series, I've encountered extraordinary individuals who have helped shape our view of historic preservation. This year's landmark lecture series focuses on the landmarks with the small l that impact the lives of different cultures, eras, and communities. Tonight, I'm honored to introduce our first lecturer in this year's series, Donald Freeman. Donald, Donald, I'm gonna call you Don, is the president of Old Structures PC, a structural engineering consulting firm specializing in historic preservation. Professional engineer with over 25 years of experience in the investigation, analysis, and restoration of landmark buildings, Mr. Friedman holds a BS in civil engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, an MA in historical studies from the New School for Social Research, and is a licensed engineer. 
In addition to his professional work, Don has taught engineering of historic structures in the building conservation programs at RPI, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Columbia University. He is the author of numerous books on building technology and historic building construction, all of which I own in my own library upstairs on the sixth floor. <laughs> Tonight's lecture will take us back to New York in 1900 and remind us of what that time and place was like during that period of history through the lens of the building fabric and its representation of the city's demographics, living conditions, and industry. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Don Friedman. Thanks, Lisa. Um, okay, let me share my screen. Hopefully you're now seeing my, my uh, title slide there. Um, today's topic is, uh, the, the simple description of it is, I wanted to talk about what things actually looked like in the past. And it, it, this topic is sort of the collision of two trains of thought. Um, the first one is that surviving buildings of the past, and in particular, buildings that are designated as landmarks, don't necessarily provide a very good representation of what the built environment as a whole used to look like. Uh, it, it's very easy if you go looking for pictures of 1900, which is the year that I've, I've chosen and try to focus on. It's very easy to find pictures from 1900 that show interesting buildings from then. Um, it show, you, you can find buildings, pictures of buildings that uh, were famous in 1900 uh, that have survived and have become landmarks. Um, some of them have been torn down and, and you know, they should have been landmarked. That, that's what you see when you go looking for pictures of 1900. Um, I, so, several of my slides are of more ordinary buildings and it took quite a bit of effort to get good pictures of ordinary buildings because in that era when photography was, was much more difficult than it is today, um, ordinary buildings and ordinary streetscapes weren't necessarily where people were focused uh, when, they, when they wanted to, to take pictures. So that's the first train of thought that um, what we see today of the past isn't necessarily representative of the past. The second, the second train of thought is that we all have a natural tendency to conflate the past with old. And that, that's flat out, that's a mistake. This is a 1910 picture of the Singer Building, uh, which for a very brief moment was the tallest building in the world. Uh, when we look at this today, we see a old, very old fashioned looking building. Um, it, it, it's a skyscraper, yes, but it's a very old fashioned skyscraper. Uh, with the curved mansards and, and very heavy masonry ornament. It's old. But in 1910, that building was brand new. And the reason that this picture was taken was to show off the, the latest thing in architecture and engineering. Look at this modern achievement. Um, so to really understand this picture, what we need to do is get into the mindset of, uh, of you know, what did people think they were taking pictures of when they took a picture? What did they think they were seeing when they saw this? We look at the, that picture and we see an old fashioned building. People back then looked at it and saw something very new and very interesting because it was new. So there, there, there's really a change in, in mindset. Um, this, is a, this is a good example of a, a famous landmark. This is called Skirmahorn Row. It's at the, the Fulton Fish Market. Um, this is a group of industrial loft buildings uh, that were constructed in, eight, in around 1812 or so. Um, it has been landmarked for quite some time. It has been restored. Uh, and as you can see in this photograph, um, it's now no longer quite an industrial site. I'm very glad that these buildings are landmarked. I'm very glad that they have survived. It's much better that, that we have them than not. But when you look at these buildings, you don't have really very much of a context for what, what they were used for, what they looked like when they were first built and they were being used for their original purpose. Um, th this was, these were industrial buildings and it was part of a very busy working port area. And it's now pretty much pure tourism and, and uh, retail use. And it's just, it's a very different thing. Uh, so it's hard to get the sense of what it looked like looking at this modern photograph. Uh, 
here's sort of the other, the flip side of that same problem. This is Grand Central Station in 1902. Um, now, the history of Grand Central is a little bit convoluted. The original building was built in 18, it was completed in 1871. Uh, and it was three stories tall and had towers with curved mansard roofs on them. And if you look way off on the right side here, you can sort of see that's an extension to the station and they, that didn't get expanded. In 1898, so when the building was, was not yet 30 years old, it was doubled in height. Uh, there was, the, the building by 1898, the, the station was grossly inadequate to the amount of train traffic. Um, and uh, expanding the building and alterations that were made to the trains, uh, to, the, to the tracks at the time and the platforms at the time were all meant to increase the capacity uh, and basically failed. Um, the building was expanded in 1898 and then torn down before another 10 years had, had passed to build the current station. Um, so again, in 1902, this is a postcard showing off the brand new Grand Central. Um, however old fashioned it looks, this is, this is a postcard that is celebrating something brand new. Uh, and it's also very carefully framed. This is 42nd Street on the right. This is Vanderbilt Avenue on the left. Things you can't see in this photograph. You can't see the, uh, there's an elevated train just off to the right, just outside the frame of the, the photograph um, that was a spur of the Third Avenue L to make it easy to get to the station. Um, and I have a picture later on to show you what was going on behind the station. Uh, in other words, where the trains were. This is a, a very clean looking, very pretty shot. Um, that's not necessarily the way people perceived the station at the time. I have a good piece of news. This is literally my only text slide in the whole presentation. Uh, why did I choose 1900? Um, so I, I wanted to, to do this thing where I'm gonna try to get old photographs that aren't of landmark buildings, aren't of famous things, uh, to give you a sense of, of what it was like to be a New Yorker in, 19, in, in, in the past, not chosen 1900, to, to be a New Yorker walking around, what did things look like? Um, so there were a couple of constraints on this. It needed to be late enough that uh, photography had improved enough that there were enough pictures. Uh, early uh, glass negative photography took a very long time. And as a result, it was difficult to get, you, we've all seen these photographs where people are a blur because there were long exposures. By the 1890s, the exposure was down to under a second. So, so you don't have that problem anymore. Um, so I needed, photography, photographic technology to have developed to the point where I could get the photographs I want. Uh, so that sort of forced it to the end of the 19th century. Um, 1898 is a very big year in New York, in New York history. That's the year that uh, New York swallowed Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. Uh, Manhattan, which used to be the entire city, had swallowed the West Bronx in 1874 and the East Bronx in 1895. Um, so it, it sort of makes sense to, to have New York be the same size it is now. That's 1898. Uh, and, and consolidation was politically a big deal. It, it, you know, the city uh, absorbing its uh, largest and nearest suburbs. Um, 1901 is a very big year in terms of housing. That's the year that, that what we now call the new tenement law went into effect um, and very much changed what housing looked like in the city. Uh, it took a while for, for the change to happen, but um, I'm gonna be talking about uh, tenements and the difference between old law tenements, the ones that were built in the 18, late 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, and new law tenements, the ones built after that is huge. Uh, and a lot of what we think of as modern New York is based on the new tenement law. Um, the vast majority of walk-up apartment houses in Upper Manhattan and the Bronx, for example, were built under the new tenement law, were built after 1901. So if I want something that is more of the past, I need it to be before that. Um, and then finally, th there's, there were a whole lot of technological changes that affected life that were going on at that time. Um, the first electric, uh, 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 commercial electric plant in the city uh, is the 1880s, um, but that doesn't mean everybody immediately got electric lights. And uh, in 1900, quite a few homes were still lit by gas. Uh, probably the majority, I'd have to look into that, but I, it, gas was still very much present as lighting. Um, 
um, the subway opened in 1904, the first subway opened in 1904. So that, so that yet had not happened. So by going before the subway opened and before everyone had electric lights, I get us into more of the past and less uh, something that's less the recognizable modern city we have today. So it, it's sort of pressure from both sides, wanting to go far enough into the past that we're looking at something that is not the New York we all know, um, but close enough to the present that certain things uh, are recognizable. The boundary of the city is the same as we have today and photography uh, rather than having to rely on engravings for pictures is, is uh, I think important. Um, I'm going to be talking very much about Manhattan. Uh, a lot of what I say, I could, I could have found very similar photographs for Brooklyn. So uh, that's uh, roughly the same. Keep in mind that before consolidation in 1898, New York and Brooklyn were the first and third largest cities in the country. So New York absorbing Brooklyn was a, was a big deal uh, in that sense. Um, but a lot of what is, what is part of the city today and was part of the city in 1900 after consolidation is really not recognizable. And for that reason, uh, it, I could show pictures, but there would be pictures that, that there's almost no context for. Um, this is an intersection that, that I've known my whole life, uh, and probably quite a few of you have seen this intersection, and I would guess that almost none of you can recognize it. Um, this is in Queens. Uh, the street that's running left to right is Main Street in Flushing, and the street that we are looking down with the very large uh, island in the middle with the fountain on it is Northern Boulevard. Uh, this is a very heavily trafficked street today and has been uh, for close to 100 years. Um, but in 1900, this, this photograph is actually 1906. Uh, in, in 1900, it was still um, suburban is really the only word you can use for this. Uh, and that, that's great, that's fascinating. And I like this picture very much. Um, it certainly is not the Northern Boulevard that I, I grew up with, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like New York. It feels like suburbia. That's all leading up to, to several big categories I wanna talk about. First one I wanna talk about is how people lived. This is not how people lived. This is how a tiny percentage of people lived. Um, this is the house of uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt II. Uh, this photograph is from 1901. Oh, by the way, just in case it's not clear, this is the house here. That, that, that whole huge mass of masonry in the center is his house. Uh, the photograph is taken in 1901. The house was built in 1883. It was designed by George Post, who was one of the leading architects of the era. Um, the, the address of the house is 1 West 57th Street. We're looking at the north end at 58th Street. In other words, this thing that you can just barely make out on the right-hand side here is the Grand Army Plaza. We're looking down Fifth Avenue on the left. Um, the first church spire you see is the Fifth Avenue Presbyterian Church at 56th Street. So. Uh, if you're familiar with Fifth Avenue in Midtown, you know where this is, and you know that it doesn't look anything like this and has not looked anything like this for a very long time. This is a very uh, peaceful, genteel scene uh, of wealthy people living in mansions. Um, and if Vanderbilt's house still, still existed, it would certainly be landmarked. It would most likely be a museum or something similar if it still existed. Uh, but of course it was torn down a long time ago. Um, you see pictures like this quite a bit when you go look at, at histories because this is what people took pictures of. Um, this is, a, this is a, 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 the kind of view of New York that the city fathers wanted to, to present to people. Um, and it's, it's fine for what it is. It's an interesting building designed by a famous architect on an interesting street. It is not representative of the city in any way. It's representative of a, of a very small group of people. Um, here is something that we are all familiar with and is much more representative, although still, still a minority. Um, this is a, a modern photograph, but one of the interesting things is you have to actually work at it for a minute to, to make sure it is a modern photograph. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So, uh, brownstone row houses of this type, and that this particular row is in Brooklyn, um, were for the professional classes. There were smaller scale row houses also built in the, in the 1870s, uh, but for, for people with not quite as much money, but that was actually pretty rare. 
Um, New York was not a city where poor people had houses for the most part. Uh, and you, you, while there are a lot of uh, Brownstone Row houses built in the city and particularly built in Brooklyn um, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, uh, it was already dying out by 1900 because the economics of, of, of construction and housing simply didn't work anymore. Um, th this New York only made sense as a city economically if people were living in multiple dwellings and commuting by rail. Otherwise, uh, it just, it was too big and would strangle on its own size. Um, so th this is a very pretty row and it, it uh, has, been, has been largely preserved. You've got the iron handrails on the stoops, which are great. How can you actually tell that this is a modern photograph? There's a few things. Well, we've got an air conditioner right here and here. Um, the windows, the window frames are white because those are replacement aluminum or vinyl windows. Uh, the original wood windows would have had black painted frames. Um, and it does change the appearance of the houses a bit, uh, not so much. There's, there's one house here with black framed windows and you can see what that looks like. Um, we've got a child guard up here, which is a late 20th century thing. And the, uh, the canopies that are over the doors, and there's one on the closest to us and there are a few more down here, those canopies are metal. Um, there have been similar canopies used on row houses in New York since these buildings were brand new, uh, but they used to be cloth. So it's sort of all minor changes to the appearance um, that you have to go looking for. If you just take a fast look, it's a row of brownstones. It could just as easily be 140 years ago as today. Uh, and, and that sort of unchanging aspect of it is nice. It also means that you can get a feeling for the past by just picking the right block in Brooklyn and walking down it and taking a look at the houses. Where did the majority of people in Manhattan live? They lived in tenements. Um, and this is amazingly, this is a postcard of Hester Street. Uh, I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why there's a postcard showing showing what is basically a slum, but there it is. Uh, so the um, this kind of tenement um, was the the pro and when I say sorry, this kind of tenement, the one on the end here, the, these the, the modern tenements on the end closest to us. Um, those are products of the new tenement law, uh, which went into uh, sorry the old tenement law, which went into effect in 1879. Um, and they are basically monstrosities. Uh, they are buildings that are huge filing cabinets for people. Um, their construction led to the Lower East Side having one of the densest collections of people in history uh, by 1900. It, it was just a, a simple exercise in how many people can you pack into a building and then filling up the entire block with buildings like that. Uh, and if you think I'm exaggerating that when I say this is how most people, this is how most people lived in 1900, the, the population of Manhattan was a bit over 2 million people and more than three quarters of them lived in tenements. Um, and tenements varied in quality, some were better than others, um, but none of them were particularly good. Uh, the 1901 tenement law was a reaction to these, to these buildings very specifically. Um, and it outlawed all of the worst things about them. Um, air shafts, having windows on air shafts uh, that were less than a foot across so that you could open your window and stick your hand out and touch the neighboring building. Um, the old law tenements did not, were not required to have toilets. They were, uh, the people who built them were allowed to put privies in the rear yard. Um, so as late as 1900, there were people in brand new buildings in, in Manhattan who did not have toilets in, in their apartment. Um, I could keep going, but you get the sense of it. The, the, the required size of a rear yard was, uh, I believe, 15 feet on a 100 foot deep lot. Um, the, these buildings are sort of a testament to how clever you can be in packing people onto a, onto a site. Um, so this, this is, now Hester Street is on the Lower East Side. It was a shopping street, you can see um, both the, uh, the stores that are in the first floor of the buildings and also push carts in the street. Uh, this is a very honest photograph in some, re in some regards that you see all of that. Uh, you can also just barely make out here, this fellow with the white helmet um, works for the sanitation department and he's opened up the hydrant for the children to play in, uh, which is something that you know, these days it sort of has a, a quaint feel to it. Um, but think about, you know, summer in New York with the heat and humidity and not only not having air conditioning at home, um, but having very bad ventilation at home because you live in an old, in an old law tenement and that there's no place to go to cool off. 
So uh, opening up the hydrants for the kids was, was um, it wasn't necessary, but it was, it was actually very important. Uh, and this, this is, I'll have some other views of tenements, but this gives you sort of a sense of, uh, of how crowded things are when you look at that street. One other thing, this is a postcard. That sky looks very fake to me. Um, I, people, Photoshop obviously did not exist yet, uh, but people had learned how to, uh, how to paint on top of a, a film negative. Um, so one of the things about glass negatives is that they're fragile and this thing at the top here is a, a break in the negative. Um, so as I said, uh, you know, some, of these, some of these things sort of today have a vaguely nostalgic tone to them. Um, you look at all that, all that uh, laundry left out to dry and you think about the amount of labor involved in that, in that washing and involved in ordinary daily chores in buildings that had very limited numbers of sinks, very limited numbers of toilets, uh, obviously all walk up, no elevators. Um, just ordinary life was more difficult because of, of the kind of building you were living in. And this shot, you know, it has sort of a, a formal uh, artistic quality to it. But then you think about what, what, what that represents, what all that, uh, all that clothing drying represents. And it's a little bit different. Um, you, can, you can just make out a church off in the distance here. And this very gothic-y looking building on the right is a public school. Everything else you're seeing in this photograph is a tenement. So again, the, the, the neighborhoods that were built up this way um, were largely solid tenements. Uh, there, there, were, there were, I'll be getting to this in a little while, there were no playgrounds the way we understand them today. There were no small parks for the most part. It was just block after block of buildings. And this, Photograph I think was used in the, uh, the the announcement card for the talk. Um, I, I this is one of the I, I included the caption because the caption gives you a sense of how different people's view of the past view of things was in the past. East 39th Street, an entire block planted by the tenement shade tree committee. So these little trees, which have just been planted, and there's not all, actually all that many of them. That's what they're bragging about. Um, and obviously they looked at this and they saw you have, you have a block that had nothing and we've given people shade trees. I look at this and I see an entire solid row of old law tenements here. This is something like a dozen buildings in a row. Um, and the presence of those trees does not mitigate that. So uh, how people, perceive things is very much based on the context of where they're coming from. I, I grew up in a world where there were playgrounds and the occasional park and street trees. So I, I would not brag about planting a half dozen street trees, um, but that is, that is where people's perception of things was at that time. Moving on to a different building type. Um, this is the very first uh, photograph of Manhattan taken from an airplane, 1906. So again, I've missed my 1900 date, but I'm, I'm close. Um, it's, not, it's not the clearest photograph, obviously. Uh, a, a few things jump out at me when I look at this. The first one is, um, and as someone who has researched skyscrapers quite a bit, is how small the skyscraper district is compared to what's around it. Uh, you don't have the situation you have today where there are skyscrapers in every neighborhood in Manhattan. There are tall buildings um, where downtown, where I'm sitting right now, is tall buildings from one side of the island to the other. Um, part of this low area here along the East River is, is now the South Street Seaport, but most of those buildings have been replaced by, by much bigger buildings. This industrial waterfront on both sides of the island is gone and replaced by uh, pleasure facilities, parks and, and, and uh, things like that, replaced by um, landfill. Um, this, is, this is the site of Battery Park City here on the left. Um, you know, so things, th it was a very different 
feeling then. You, you did not have a neighborhood of nothing but tall buildings. You had a small area of nothing but tall buildings. And even that isn't really true as I'll show you some photographs in a, in a while, but it's surrounded by a, the low rise working city. Um, in addition to this, this little knot of buildings here at the foot of the island, uh, there's sort of a, a, a row of tall buildings intermediate with interspersed with other buildings uh, up the Broadway spine of the island. Um, there's another knot at Union Square. There's another knot at Madison Square. Uh, and, and eventually they would keep spreading up the island. But basically it, it, it's, it's a new phenomenon, which sort of explains why people were so obsessed with it. Uh, why did people keep taking photographs of tall buildings in 1900? And the answer was, it was something new. It was something completely different and it was out of scale to everything else. News is, is what you take photographs of, not things you've seen before. So all of these small commercial buildings that are the bulk of the buildings in lower Manhattan, they don't get the photographs taken because they're boring, they're old news. Everyone knows about them. Um, so you have to, again, how did people see what, what, they, what, they, were, what they were seeing? Um, this is the Fulton Market. Uh, this is a bit earlier. This is this is the eighteen. This is the late eighteen seventies. Um, but what's interesting is that if you, if I had a picture of the Fulton Market in nineteen hundred, it would look very much the same. Uh, things didn't really change so much uh, until they had to. Um, the city provided the market building. Other uh, the the people who worked there used it. Uh, these buildings weren't really maintained very well, and they weren't really cared cared about. Nobody. Nobody looked at the building at the market, they looked at the, the contents. Um, so what you get is the original market building here has these lean-tos built in front of it. Uh, and this is a working area. If you look down here, somebody has put up an ad for, uh, for some snake oil, if you wanna drink whatever, that, whatever it is um, Dr. Richard was selling. Um, I guarantee you this whole area smelled of fish because that's, that was one of the main things being sold at the Fulton Market. But the most interesting thing in this picture in the context of what I, what I want to talk about is this, these buildings back here, those are buildings of the same era and the same basic type and the same construction as Skirmahorn Row. That's not Skirmahorn Row, we're looking the wrong direction. It's a bunch of buildings that look just like Skirmahorn Row um, and that, that didn't survive long enough to be landmarked. Uh, and you can see, you know, as working buildings, the one on the end has been painted, the one next to it has been, has not been painted. Um, they have different, uh, they have different shutters. They, they've been altered in different ways based on the people using them. Um, the, a working building like this never looks as pretty as, as in reality as it does uh, when we clean it up and we preserve it and we change its use. Um, so if, Skirmahorn Road looked like this, you know, it might not be quite as, as uh, famous and taken in so many, take, have so many tourist pictures taken of it. Um, and again, the original Fulton Market building is quite a bit better looking than what it looks like here because it didn't have all this, all this stuff in front of it, except that the stuff represents people's livelihoods. That, that, that's, that's, where they're, that's where they're doing their jobs. So, you know, if you were to preserve this building today, if, if this building still existed, um, you know, do, you, do you save all of these very cheaply built and sort of temporary additions or do you uh, clean them up and, and present a, a basically a fake view of the past? And this is a, a preservation philosophy question that has never been given a, a permanent answer and probably never will be given a permanent answer because it depends on the building and it depends on what the past use was. The, uh, there is a building down at the Fulton Market now, which was built in the 1980s, which was deliberately built to look something like this. And, and not trying to fool anybody, just architecturally, it, it does resemble this a bit, um, but it, it, was, it was built as a modern building for uh, retail use, and therefore it's never going to get those additions out front. I'm just gonna keep coming back to tenements because it's hard to stay away. Um, this is a later photograph. This is a 1920 photograph. There's only, that only means one thing. These high rises off in the distance, 
That's, those are uh, steel frame apartment houses on Park Avenue uh, that were built in the, in the late teens and 20s. Um, so you have to imagine them not being there. That's the, if you took this picture in 1900, that would be basically the only thing that would be different. Everything else here uh, predates 1900. What is everything else here? Well, we've got a church, obviously. We've got some old law tenements and we've got a long row of old law tenements. So that's the, the, the south side of the block. Um, and that is, uh, that's 90th street, yeah. The south side of the block is all tenements. This big building here and the low buildings next to it is a brewery. Uh, it's the Rupert Brewery. They produce Knickerbocker beer. Um, this entire site has been replaced uh, by a bunch of modern high rise apartment houses. Uh, but this is very much what was going on at the time, which is that you had um, industry and making beer as a form of, of, of industrial work uh, interspersed with housing. There's no such thing as zoning. Uh, the first real zoning law in New York is 1916. Uh, and even that didn't have, didn't have the kind of controls over, over use that we, uh, that we expect out of zoning today. Um, so if you look at a map of the east side in 1900, and I'm talking about the entire east side from down by the Brooklyn Bridge all the way up to East Harlem, you have industry and tenements sort of alternating. Uh, and part of that is that if you were making literally a couple of dollars a day as your, as your wage, uh, you didn't want to spend a nickel on a trolley to, to commute if you didn't have to. So um, it, it helped to have jobs nearby. And I don't know that people would necessarily move if they got a job somewhere else, but maybe they did. This is, I, I would have to go into very detailed records that um, are actually inaccessible at this time because the uh, city archive is, is still closed on lockdown. Uh, I have to believe that some of the people living in these tenements on the south side of 90th Street worked for Rupert and walked across the street to go to, go to work. Uh, which is both good and bad. It's, it's uh, bad to be living across the street from an industrial site. Um, it's good to uh, have, it in the, have your job in the neighborhood if you can. Uh, and just again, to put things in perspective, three quarters of the city lived in tenements in 1900, roughly a quarter of the employment uh, in Manhattan was industrial in 1900. So a lot of people living in, uh, in tenements worked someplace like this, not heavy industry. That's not what New York had. We had a lot of, of other uh, lighter forms of industry. And of course, uh, Mr. Coyle, the undertaker, um, his staff had to live somewhere. Uh, this is this is sort of recognizable as being Central Park West, um, and I'll, I'll get I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, this is uh, 1895, and we have a horse-drawn streetcar. Um, there, the, the 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 sequence in New York went uh, horse-drawn omnibuses, which is to say something that more or less did what a bus does today, but had horses as the motive power. Um, gave way to horse-drawn streetcars. Uh, Lower Manhattan had, had cable cars uh, with, again, the cable running in, in the street. Uh, Brooklyn had trolleys, eventually. Upper Manhattan and the Bronx had trolleys. Uh, Lower Manhattan had um, electric streetcars, except instead of having an overhead wire for trolley, the electric power was, it was similar to a third rail. It was in, in the same slot in the street where the cable used to run for, for the cable cars. Uh, so this is capturing a moment where we haven't got to the electric streetcars yet because we still have the horse-drawn streetcar uh, way out in suburbia in, in uh, 70th Street and Central Park West. Um, there are three, you can see three buildings here. First one is the, the Majestic Hotel, then the Dakota, and then the San Remo Hotel. And for those of you who know Central Park West, you go, that's not the Majestic and the, it's not the San Remo. The buildings that are there now, which were both built in the 1920s, were named after the buildings that were demolished when they built the new ones. So uh, there, there's, there's been a Majestic Hotel on Central Park West much longer than the current building. There's been a San Remo much longer than the current building. Um, but you have here uh, these three buildings. Well, why is 
such great real estate, such a great place to live. Why, why are there vacant lots? Why is, don't more people live here? And the answer is that there, in 1895, there's no subway. Um, and the Upper West Side uh, had, it, it, it's, its basic connection to the rest of the city um, was uh, elevated trains running along what, what's now Columbus Avenue, running along Ninth Avenue. Um, and they were, they were very slow. Uh, they were not necessarily a great way to get downtown. So unless, if you weren't leading a life of leisure, relying on the L wasn't necessarily the best thing. Uh, this is, again, a little bit later than, than my year. Uh, this is everything owned by the IRT company. And the heavy line is the first subway, which had opened two years earlier in 1904. Runs from South Ferry up the east side. That's That's... This portion here is what's now the four, five, and six trains up to Grand Central, turned west along what's now the shuttle, and then went on the Upper West Side along what's now the one, two, and three lines. So there, there's one subway line. Everything else you're seeing, that's the Ninth Avenue L there, that's the Sixth Avenue L, the Third Avenue L, and the Second Avenue L. Uh, the very light dashed lines are streetcars run by the Interborough. Other companies ran streetcars as well. Uh, very important point. You here's the Brooklyn Bridge. The Williamsburg Bridge had just opened, and that's it. There are no other bridges or tunnels. Um, there, the uh, there's no tunnel. There's no tunnels under the East River uh, of any type, including subway. Uh, in 1900, it was just the Brooklyn Bridge. That was literally the only non-ferry way to get between Manhattan and Brooklyn in 1900. Um, if you want to go to New Jersey, the Hudson and Manhattan tubes, which is what's now the PATH train, had not opened yet. Uh, the tunnels had been started in the 1870s, but they weren't completed until 1908, uh, which is a whole story into itself. So all of these dashed lines you're seeing in the river, those are ferry routes. And th those were not uh, little ferries like the East River Ferry today. Um, th those were big ferries, uh, more along the lines of the Staten Island Ferry, because that was the way to get across the rivers. Uh, so, and, and I'll come back to uh, the ferries in a little while, but this map emphasizes uh, certain things and it has to do with the way people thought of it. We don't worry about crossing the East River. There are now, uh, there are now four bridges and uh, I think a dozen tunnels <laughs> all told under the East River. It's not a big deal to get across. It was at that time. Um, here is the Bowery with the Third Avenue well overhead. And this is a nice collection of every way that people got around at that time. Uh, this is 1896. We have here a cable car. Uh, we have horse-drawn wagons of various types. Uh, we have the elevated train and you can sort of make out the elevated train has a steam engine pulling it. So if you think about sort of it's unpleasant being underneath an L today um, because it's dark, it's noisy. If it rained in the last day, you're probably getting dripped on from water that's sitting up on top of the elevated structure. Uh, at that time, you had to also worry about soot falling onto you from a steam engine. Um, but that's not, that's not the real pollution here. The real pollution uh, are those quaint horse-drawn wagons um, there were roughly 100,000 working horses in the city in 1900, and they produced two and a half million pounds of manure every day. And all of that had to, get, had to go away somehow. In theory, it was all cleaned up and disposed of. Um, I, I would guess, and this is based on having been in high school when the, the pooper scooper law for dogs went into effect, I would guess that not all of it got perfectly cleaned up. Um, so think about what the streets were like with two and a half million pounds of manure being deposited every single day. Uh, it makes you understand why people would jump at something like an electric train. This is not me criticizing horses, it's just criticizing the use of them in certain areas. Um, elevated trains were slower than the subways, they had lower capacity, uh, and you know we look at we look at a picture like this and, and we go oh look that that that's an old fashioned train except that real service on the L's began in 1872. Um, there were a couple of sort of 
false starts with the Ninth Avenue L going into the 18, going back to the 1860s. But real service is 1872 on the Ninth Avenue L, and over the next few years, it spread to the other three lines. Um, in 1900, the L's were only 28 years old, uh, which is still pretty new. Um, I, I, I put in my notes to myself, that's the same age that the song, the Macarena is today. Uh, so yeah, th this is not, people at that time would not look at this and see something old. They would look at this and see something new. Um, this is a view downtown. Uh, that's Manhattan Life Insurance building off in the distance there. Uh, and that's American Surety. And this is, the, this is the L doing a big S curve over the open space of Quente Slip uh, in order to get from one very narrow street to another, um, heading down to South Ferry. Uh, so this is just sort of, you know, giving you the feel of what, what, what it was like to be on what's theoretically a park down here. And you can see it's being used as, as uh, storage for horse-drawn wagons. Um, What's funny is this view has probably changed less than just about anything else I've got. This is uh, 6th Avenue in the teens, um, and a lot of those buildings are still there, uh, interestingly enough, but with the elevated running down the middle of it. Um, and you know, looking at it today, this, this doesn't feel very much like New York to me. Looking at it today, what it actually looks very much like is Wabash Avenue in Chicago, um, where you have an elevated running through a late 19th century commercial district, which is exactly what this is at the time. Um, here is a view from a tall building in lower Manhattan looking, uh, looking east. This is South Ferry right here. And what you can see is the elevated trains. These are the east side elevated trains on the left and this is the west side elevated trains on the right. They all went down to South Ferry um, the main thing at South Ferry at that time was not the Staten Island Ferry, it was the Brooklyn Ferry. Uh, before the Brooklyn Bridge was built, the Brooklyn, there were a series of ferries on the East River that most of the traffic was Brooklyn to, to Manhattan. Some went to Queens, one went to Staten Island, but there's a ferry boat and there's a ferry boat and they are both heading to Brooklyn. This very pretty little building here is the is the old Whitehall Ferry, which, which is the building where the Staten Island Ferry was. Um, <clears throat> again, we're looking past, we're in a tall building, but we're looking past the low rise sort of semi-industrial loft buildings, e these buildings with the peaked roofs and these low buildings here, um, they're all serving the working waterfront. Uh, and uh, you can see the, the masts of ships tied up along the East River. Um, that is looking at the south, we're looking at the southwest corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue. That is, this is 1899. That is the Croton Distributing Reservoir. Um, it is pretty much the exact same size as the library that replaced it. In other words, not quite 400 feet north to south and about the same east to west. Uh, the walls are 50 feet high and roughly 25 feet thick at the base. Um, it was no longer in use by, by 1899. It, it had been abandoned because of improvements in the water distribution system. Um, you can you see the water line. See that a stain down here? Well, uh, brick isn't really the best material. Brick and granite really are not the best material to, to build a waterproof container out of. And it always leaked a bit, um, which encouraged that ivy growth that you can see. Uh, it was demolished in 1900 and uh, work on the library started shortly afterwards. So um, at that time, th this is what you saw in what's now, a, again, a very different neighborhood. Uh, this is maybe the best picture I have. This is, I said before that the Grand Central picture was very carefully framed to make things look nice. This is the back of Grand Central, uh, where this photograph I believe was taken from on top of the roof of the station itself. And this is the train yard. Um, that's, that would be 4th Avenue, what's now Park Avenue. And here's the, the train yard spreading out so that the trains can get to the station. And every single, this is 1903, every single train here uh, is pulled by a steam engine. Um, so you think about the amount of noise and coal smoke in that picture, represented in that picture. Uh, and we're looking at what's now the heart of East Midtown. Um, this truss bridge running across here is 46th Street. 
the next truss bridge back is 47th Street. Uh, so you could get east-west across the train yard, although I have to believe that was a very unpleasant walk. Um, so if you think about East Midtown, think about 42nd Street in this era, uh, what's now the UN site was a bunch of slaughterhouses. Um, you had this huge polluted mess uh, between Lexington and, and Madison Avenues, and you had the reservoir on Fifth Avenue. Everything we think about on East 42nd Street is, is a result of the 1900s creation of first uh, the public library, second Grand Central, and then a little bit later on, um, Tudor City and uh, the UN. So if you talked about the East 40s to somebody in 1900, uh, they would have a very different impression of it than we have today uh, based on this. And again, you've got up here some tenement buildings and some uh, commercial buildings. Uh, this is a view of Central Park. Um, and if that doesn't look familiar, that's because what you're looking at here is where the Great Lawn is now. <clears throat> um, at the same time that the reservoir was built at 42nd and 5th, there was a, uh, a receiving reservoir, basically a storage tank, um, built between 6th and 7th Avenues, 81st and 86th Street, except that, of course, those streets didn't exist at the time. This is in the 1840s. There were no streets that far north because nobody lived that far north. Um, shortly after the reservoir was built, uh, Central Park was planned around that site. So the park had to include this big rectangular reservoir. Uh, the reservoir was a rectangle because there was no thought of it being in the park when, in, in a park when it was built. It was built as simply a storage tank. Um, the park was planned in 1857. A small piece of it opened in 1858 and it sort of more and more opened every year. Park wasn't complete until 1876. So in 1900, the park is not even a quarter of a century old. In other words, it was still very new. Uh, the reservoir was not, but the reservoir was, was still in use and was used, uh, it, was, it was an important part of the water supply system until 1917 when it was abandoned because of, again, improvements in the water supply. Uh, it was, and it sat there abandoned for, for 20 years. Um, it was demolished in 1937 uh, in part to improve the park and in part to get rid of uh, uh, the memory of a Hooverville being at the bottom of that reservoir um, to build the Great Lawn, which is by far the biggest active play area in Central Park. So you think about your mental image of Central Park, it had, much, it had many fewer ball fields uh, before Robert Moses uh, got hold of it in 1933. This particular photograph is, from, is looking at the southwest corner of the reservoir. In other words, we're roughly at the path that leads from Central Park West to the Delacorte Theater and Turtle Pond, which looks absolutely nothing like this today. Last thing I want to talk about is just um, the fabric of the city. This is 1899 on the left and uh, the current New York City GIS uh, map on the right, um, it, pretty much exactly the same area. Now, this is the World Trade Center site, and that's sort of cheating. I feel like that's cheating in a way because that was designed to be a whole lot of open space. But if you, if you forget about that for a minute, just look at the map of 1899. Literally, the only open space on that map is the, is the graveyard at St. Paul's Chapel. If you look at the modern map, there's that same graveyard, but there's other open spaces. So what I've done here is I've colored purple, um, publicly accessible open space that's not standing in the middle of a street. And as you can see, it's, it's quite different even ignoring the World Trade Center. If you include the World Trade Center site, it's overwhelming how different it is. But even ignoring that, um, the, the 1960 zoning law created these plazas and it's really changed the, the feeling of Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan used to be nothing but buildings and streets. So what, is, what does that look like close up? Um, you can see Singer Manufacturing. This is the first Singer building. This back here is the second Singer building and all of these mid 19th century low rise buildings would be demolished uh, shortly after this photograph was taken to build two buildings, the Singer Tower and the City Investing Building. Um, so 
here's your your mid 19th century streetscape, solid buildings on every street. These two tall buildings here would be eventually be demolished for um, the construction of what we what's now called Zuccotti Park, which was a plaza built when the Singer and City Investing buildings were demolished in the 60s uh, to build um, One Liberty Street, uh, One Liberty Plaza, AKA the US Steel Building. So there's that building and there's Zuccotti Park. So there you have two solid blocks. Well, if you look at them, they're, they're just, they're city blocks. And they became, they, they, they became eventually a tower with a plaza around it and then the second plaza covering an entire block to the south. Last example I want to use of this, um, that's on the right, current map, Stuyvesant Town and Peter Cooper Village, uh, Stuyvesant Town down here and Peter Cooper Village, 20th Street in between them. On the left, uh, 18, 1899, um, that is the gas house district. And you can see the gas houses, they're those blue circles. And then what's, and, and this building here, that's Consolidated Gas, which eventually uh, became part of Con uh, Consolidated Edison. And here are all these tenement buildings right in and around the, the, uh, the gas tanks. So I, I have to say that living near gas tank, those gas tanks leaked. Living, living near gas tanks was a good way to shorten your life. Um, I am not pointing this out to recommend tear it all down urban renewal, which is obviously what happened. Uh, the people who advocated tear it all down urban renewal in the mid 19th century weren't doing so to be perverse, they, were, they, they weren't doing so uh, because they couldn't think of anything better to do. They were doing so because they were horrified by the situation where you had old law tenements butting up against gas tanks. Um, they, they wanted to get rid of the situation where you had poor people in very bad housing next to a polluted industrial site. Now, in retrospect, having learned lessons from the tear it all down urban renewal of the mid 20th century, we might say tear down the gas tanks, clean up the pollution, build new housing on the clean sites, fix the old buildings, right? That, that's a, a, a sort of a, a more uh, piecemeal approach. But in 1900, or in this case, 1940s, people didn't see it that way. What they saw in, in this picture on the left, in this map on the left, was the gas house district. It was, it was in an, a total a thing, and it was a blight. That is the way they saw this. And here's why. So here, this is uh, actually um, my only photograph from a famous photographer. This is Berenice Abbott. <clears throat> you have some row houses, you have a bunch of tenements, and then there's a gas tank. And there were more of them around. This is the Second Avenue L. Very confusingly, it's running over First Avenue in this area. Um, but this is this right here is what people wanted to get rid of was uh, having badly built. Uh, badly designed housing immediately next to a polluted industrial site. Um, so summing this up as best I can, if you look at New York in 1900, it's, it's smaller scale. It's uh, on a local level, much more dense than it is today. Um, and the truly amazing thing, it's much dirtier than it is today. Uh, there, there are pieces of the modern city that we recognize. There, there, people are starting to build steel frame buildings. There, there were electric lights, but it is still mostly a 19th century city. Um, but what's interesting is it's right on the cusp. And most of what we know today as New York uh, was either started or built in the next 25 years after 1900. Um, the transformation wasn't complete. Uh, if, you look at, if you look at 1925, you know, the Chrysler Building and Empire State Building haven't been built yet. Um, but there were a lot more steel frame skyscrapers. There were uh, the, the new law uh, tenements, which were much more livable buildings, and they're much more spread out across the city. They're all over the Bronx, lots of them in Queens, many more neighborhoods in Brooklyn have been developed. So, you know, we're, by 1925, 95 years ago, we're seeing something that looks recognizable to us, whereas in 1900, a lot of it really does not. What's interesting is that even in 1900, people in the US talked about how New York wasn't the same as the rest of the country, but back then it was much more physically mainstream than it is today, and then, or than it was in 1925. So uh, I hope that sort of gives you a sense of, of uh, 
how things have changed and not really why they've changed as much as much as how people have perceived the change. Um, thank you for your attention and I'm ready for questions. Hello, Dawn. Sorry, my, my video will be appearing shortly. Dawn, that was that was absolutely terrific. And I, I mean, those those images were just astounding. I presume it was a, it was a great pleasure to research and locate some of those wonderful images. And of course, your um, accompanying narration was absolutely wonderful you you are a mine of information um before um we start the questions i know victoria would you like to say something well, don just to echo karen's remarks i found uh, i'm a native new yorker and my or, our audience has heard that countless times but i find Im those images so comforting i do a lot of photography a lot of walking here in new york city and i love spine you really can feel you know, the, the soul of these buildings. And you mentioned Stuyvesant Town, where I live, the, the row of First Avenue. I just, I love the way the lights hit the buildings. And I really think about our history a lot. And uh, you really have brought it uh, even more so to light. So thank you so much. And I just want to say that Pooper Scooper Law, oddly enough, I ran into Mayor Koch in 2004 celebrating the 25th anniversary of, of that law. And he signed the program for me that day. It was, it was good to see him <laughs> It's an important law. <laughs> so. um, right, I, I don't know, Lisa, if you want to say anything before we start the q and I think you can start the Q&A, Karen, thank you. Okay. That was a fantastic lecture, thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Fantastic. Right. Um, now, Don, I know you're also going to be looking at the questions too. So we're going to start off with um, from Jeffrey Baldwin. Uh, there's a low risk of earthquakes in New York City. What past precautions were taken, if any? Um, up until 1996, none. <laughs> 1996, we got seismic design added to the New York City Building Code. Prior to that, um, nobody did anything along those lines. So it was just cross your fingers. Um, let's see, uh, this is, uh, okay, so this is uh, Frederick Warren, he, he's, he's questioning your definition of Hester Street as, as a slum. What do you think? Well, I, I mean, it, it depends on your definition. It was, it was a, uh, neighborhood of very poor people, which is obviously not, um, their fault. Uh, but most importantly, it was uh, people who did not have access to a lot of you know basic amenities of life, things like toilets. Uh, there, there were a lot of buildings there that still that, that relied on uh, uh, that, that relied on uh, the privies in the rear yard. The, the buildings were horribly overcrowded. Um, I, I mean, they were overcrowded even by their even by the standards of the time, um, where you would have uh, people sharing rooms, um, things like that. So it, it's. Uh, it, it, it's not meant as a judgment on anybody living or, or working on Hester Street. It is a judgment on the city that um, wasn't properly uh, policing housing. Right. Thank you. Um, to go back to that, you know, that stunning photograph of the laundry lines. This is from uh, Kathleen Benson Haskins. Uh, she wondered, could you uh, say again what, where the location of that photo was with the laundry lines? It's East Harlem. I don't remember exactly where. Right. Uh, this is from Dominique Agostino. Um, back in 1906, what was considered high rises? How many stories um, really um, contributed to making a high rise then? And he's particularly referring to the first photograph of downtown. Uh, well, um, the tallest building in the world in 1906 was the Park Row building, which still exists. It's 15 Park Row, um, and it's uh, the, the main building is 27 stories tall, and it has two little cupolas that, that go up another three stories. Um, so if the tallest building in the world is 30 stories, uh, the answer is not very much. Um, right. There, there were, in, 19, in 1900, there were uh, roughly... 
200 buildings in the city that were 10 stories or more. Um, I think that's perhaps a good cutoff. Uh, thank you. Um, and we do we do have that we do have quite a few questions coming in, so I'll try and get them through the um, ask you these fairly swiftly. And this is from uh, Louis Mazzari. Do you did you see um, Tudor City in the twenties is trying to change the context you describe of tenements and the industry all up and down the east side? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tudor City, rather famously, uh, the east facing, a lot of the east facing walls, not all of them, um, are, have very much less window area than the other facades. And the reason was that there were slaughterhouses on the East River, and that, that hadn't changed when Tudor City was built. So, you know, if you're building a, uh, a nice group of residential high rises, how do you deal with, with having that as a neighbor? And the answer was to basically uh, pretend it wasn't there by not providing windows facing that direction. Um, and, and of course, with slaughterhouses gone, it would be nice to have windows because that's the river view. Uh, at the same time, it was replacing, and, and this happened at other areas as well. It happened uh, along, for example, uh, East End Avenue. Um, it is consciously building uh, a nicer group of house, a nicer group of apartments in an area that previously did not have that. So it, it is, it is someone attempting, a developer attempting to uh, take advantage of you know cheap land in an area where uh, there there was it wasn't yet so expensive, and build something nicer, but recognizing that um, they can only control their surroundings so much. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, this is. Um... Uh, this is Abby Heller. She, um, she writes, um, presenting a human connection demographic lifestyle to the past provides a dimension that is rarely explored. And she wants to comment that she appreciates your sensitivity to this subject. Well, thank um, you. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, yes. Um, the first, this is from uh, Alina uh, Garantino. The first screen showed the flat iron building. When was that built? And what's the background on that building? Uh, it was completed in 1903. It's, it started in uh, late 1901, or early 1902. Um, it was uh, the headquarters for Fuller Construction, George Fuller Construction, which was one of the leading construction companies uh, in the city at the time. Um, and uh, it, it, technically, the name of it was the Fuller Building, and I think technically still is, but no one ever called it that. Um, and Fuller was one of the companies building modern steel frame buildings. And if you think about it, they, they chose a site where uh, you couldn't build the building that was that they wanted unless you used the steel frame. So it, it's sort of a, a, a sneaky way to show off how modern you are. Um, by building a building on a site where you couldn't build an old-fashioned building. Thank, thank you, Don. Um, this is a, a reflection on, on the present. Um, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Is the city buying, creating more open spaces and parks these days? Um, at a very, very slow rate, the city doesn't create a whole lot of new parks at this point. Um, there was the, the the amount of that has sort of come and gone over the years. Uh, it peaked uh, it, it peaked in in the 30s with uh, with the, the the two things simultaneously: the depression and uh, Robert Moses wanting to make his mark by um, building literally hundreds of playgrounds and uh, so and, and small parks across the city. Uh, then in the 60s and 70s, you had the, the Vest Pocket Park movement, which created a bunch of more, bunch more small parks. But it's, it sort of it comes and goes. Um, we have we do have some very new parks. Brooklyn Bridge Park, for example, is very new. Uh, but most of them these days are not being made by the city itself. Um, Battery Park City, for example, has a great waterfront promenade that wasn't built by the city. That was built by uh, the Battery Park City Authority. Um, Brooklyn Bridge Park, I believe, is partly similarly not city parks. Uh, there's a new park uh, at uh, the far west end of, of, of 23rd Street, 23rd Street or 14th, I'm forgetting, um, that's actually a state park. 
so it, it, it's sort of a mixture. It, 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 the, the, the rate at which it happens comes and goes. And right now we're uh, perhaps in a somewhat slower period. Right, thank you. Um, this is from uh, George Bullo. Uh, as George Post was ready, uh, already a known architect in demand, could the view of the battery have been from the roof of the NY Produce Exchange at Bowling Green, which he designed? It may have been. Um, it, it, it basically, one of the things about a skyscraper district, it could have been from any number of tall buildings that were very tightly clustered there. Uh, and, and if I if I stared at the photograph long enough, I could probably figure it out, but I have not done so. Right. These are um, these are comments from um, uh, Mary Jo Graf, Lu Louis Levine, and Jean Hawkins, and they just congratulate you on a terrific and wonderful program. Um, and thank you. This is from George Pisanis, uh, a great lecture. Um, Question, in the, in the first 1906 aerial photograph of Lower Manhattan, I could not discern Fort Clinton. Uh, was it not there? It's there, it's just a little hard to make out. Hold on, oh, this is it here. If you can see my cursor. Um, it, it's hard to make out because it has a roof on it. Uh, in 1906, I think it had already been converted from, it, 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 in the late 19th century, it was the uh, immigration station before Ellis Island opened. I believe by 1906, it had been converted to the aquarium. Uh, and then in the 40s, the aquarium was moved down to Coney Island. Um, so it, it, do, it doesn't look quite like itself because it has a roof, but there it is. Okay, thank you. Um, this was from uh, Anna Taylor uh, Swearingen. Uh, how is displacing the population handled when the old tenements were torn down? Uh, badly. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, keep in mind that, that it was it was sort of a simultaneous process. There, there are a lot of new buildings being built um, further out for the most part, and, and the Bronx being one of the, the main locations for that. This goes along with transportation. Um, if you had to rely on the L's, getting to and from the Bronx was a very long ride. Once the subway was built to the Bronx and you had the express trains, it became a lot faster. Uh, so the, the construction of better apartment houses in the outer boroughs and the construction of the subways go, go hand in hand. Um, there was no formal process for moving people out of old tenements and into better housing. Uh, but what did happen is that um, a lot of the changes were not, a lot of the changes in laws were not grandfathered. So by 1900, for example, most uh, old law tenements had, had in, internal plumbing. Um, but the ones that didn't, uh, the landlords were faced with the, the, you know, they could spend the money to build internal plumbing or they could give up on the building. And since most of these buildings were designed to make the money back that it cost to build them, in 10 or 15 years. I mean, they talked about 30, but uh, these buildings were built very cheaply specifically so that you could make your money back very quickly. Um, I, I suspect a lot of landlords said, okay, you know, I've, I've played my game with the building and it's over and now it's time to tear it down and move on, uh, which had the effect of opening up uh, construction sites to other uses. Um, but there was, no, there was no formal process for moving people. Right, thank you. Now, Melissa Gordon wonders, when did they start creating open spaces for height of buildings in zoning laws? And she, she comments she knows Zuccotti Park is an example of this. That's, that's the 1960 zoning law. The okay. 1916 zoning law was the one that created wedding cakes because it required setbacks. The 1960 zoning law said instead of having setbacks at the top of the building, we'll create plazas at the bottom of the building and you get the same effect. So the 1960 law led to uh, tall buildings without setbacks in a plaza in the same way that the 1916 law had led to the wedding cakes. Right, thank you. Now, I see we still have uh, quite a few questions to, um, to, to, go, uh, to go through. Um, and I believe it is now uh, 7.14. So would you be happy to take a few, uh, a few more questions, John? 
I'm happy to take a few more. I noticed we have more open now than we did when we started. So. Yes, we did. I have noticed that. I have noticed that too. Um, Karen, may I just yes. follow up on that? Don, with the with earthquake considerations, what 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 changed? What in terms of the design? What did was there an incident? What, uh, no, uh, ba basically, uh, as it, starting in the 1920s, there's been continual research into earthquake uh, risk in different parts of the country, starting in the areas where it was known to be bad, which is to say California, uh, more than anything else, but the West Coast, um, but eventually including the whole country. There's been research into how buildings react to earthquakes. And by the 1980s, it was clear that um, portions of the country that were, that had not been considered high risk do have a risk. I mean, people have always known, there have always been minor earthquakes on the East Coast. Uh, and at some point it becomes difficult to justify not having it in the building code, even if it's a lower risk than the West Coast. Um, so there was no one incident. It was, it was sort of the result of, of uh, continuing research. What's interesting is that it has had not that big an effect on the biggest buildings in New York because we have a high wind risk and a low earthquake risk. And if you design a, a high rise in New York for full wind load, the difference in what it takes to design for an earthquake is not very great. Uh, the buildings that really are, are the biggest risk in an earthquake in New York are the buildings I've been talking about, the tenements and the row houses, because um, they're not designed for lateral load at all. They, they work because they're low rise buildings and they're, they're in low rise neighborhoods and protected from wind, but uh, they, that they're the kind of building that doesn't perform very well in earthquakes. If we had a full code earthquake, um, I would expect to see damage to those buildings. Uh, we, we never have that I know of. We, we've had earthquakes in New York, but we've never had anything approaching uh, our code design load. Thank you. Um, and yes, yeah, thank you, Don. And really, your your um, infinite knowledge about all these topics is extremely impressive. So, so thank you. Um, there were two two sort of related questions about when fire exits um, were added. I wonder if you could you, you could address that. Uh, Paul Ox, Peter Oxenham writes: Some of the tenement housing showed fire escapes on a few of the buildings, but not all. And I know there was someone else who also was asking fire escapes um so if you if, if you could say something when when where do you know the date of approximately when fire escapes started to be adding added to the building storm i used to <laughs> <laughs> so uh depending on when the buildings were built they may have been built after fire escapes were required uh on all multiple dwellings or they may have been built before and then those that was not a grandfathered uh, requirement. In other words, when fire escapes began to be required, you had to go back and add them to buildings that didn't already have them. So it depends on uh, it depends on, on when the photograph was taken and when the building was built. Um, it, it, it's it's a late nineteenth century thing that fire escapes were required on all residential buildings, and it wasn't grandfathered. But I don't remember the date. Right. Okay. When that, I was the other question, uh, the other person asked about that was Claiborne Ray. Um, so I think we had a question about the. Where would you? This is um, from someone who's anonymous. Where would you recommend we go to find uh, to find original floor plans of pre-war buildings, both townhouses and larger apartment buildings? Um, townhouses, you you would have to be very lucky. Uh, for the most part. The original drawings for those are long, long gone. Um, for the old apartment houses, uh, it, it depends on which, which kind of building you're talking about. Uh, there were a number of uh, books put out in the, oh, around 1910 maybe, um, that include a lot of buildings in, uh, on the Upper West Side, a few on the Upper East Side, quite a few in Upper Manhattan. Um, that, are, that have been digitized and are available at the New York Public Library website. One of them is called Classic, uh, Classic Six, I think, uh, is, is what the, uh, the Times calls that sort of sub website where they have that. Uh, and they have floor plans. Uh, 
Uh, there is also Columbia University has a, uh, a collection of real estate ephemera, which includes uh, the realtors floor plans that were used in um, renting out buildings when they were when they were first built. And uh, out of curiosity, I went and I looked up the building in Queens I grew up in, which was built in 1959, and they had it. So um, very nondescript apartment house in Flushing, and they, they had a, uh, a realtor's brochure basically that had a floor plan of that building. So uh, the answer is the um, Columbia, Columbia's website for uh, real estate uh, documents, which is uh, I believe run by the, the School of Architecture and the New York Public Library website. Thank you. Um, this is from uh, Paul Anapertstek. Do you have any intention of turning, uh, obviously, what is a vast amount of research into a book? And he also adds, your historic building construction has become a Bible for him. Is this something you've thought about? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, 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 the, the problem is that this, there's almost nothing I've said here today is new. In other words, all of this is bits and pieces of other people's research that, as I said at the very beginning, I had these two trains of thought and, and the, these images are the ones that, that uh, cover both, co cover both thoughts. Um, so it, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard to write a book about something that, where there's literally nothing new. <laughs> um, it's, all, it's all things that have been researched and written about before. Yeah, but you 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 present them so comprehensively, Don. That would be something. I mean, I there I can completely understand why an audience member is is, is asking that question after hearing your presentation. Um, and uh, Mary Jo Graf, you're asking this this uh, this presentation will be um, available afterwards. And I do I do want to say because we're not going to be able to get to everyone's question, but. Um, I will, um, I will, you know, you've gone to the trouble of um, um, submitting questions and your questions are excellent. But we will, um, I will share these questions with uh, Dawn after the fact if we don't get to your question tonight. And also to say, I'm sorry for anyone who's raised their hands, but it's not possible to get to you if you've raised their hands. Um, so let's, let's see. Well, now we've, I've, I've, I've just encouraged someone else to raise their hand, let's see. Um, I don't know if you've seen drawn any questions that um, you would you would like to you would like to address. Yeah, I, I do feel like I shortchanged the the uh, boroughs other than other than Manhattan. So Jeff Jacobson asked uh, about uh, how does the reservoir at Forty Second Street compare to the the one at Mount Prospect in Brooklyn, um, and and the answer is it that's you're dead on target. Uh, there was Brooklyn had its own water supply system. Um, based on well, entirely on Long Island, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and uh, the distribution reservoir was uh, located um, at the the north. I guess it's the, the sort of the north corner of the the Pentagon that is Prospect Park, uh, and uh, the reason the reason is that's a, a hill. It's a high point, so it's a good place to put the reservoir. Um, the official name of the Forty Second Street Reservoir was the Murray Hill Reservoir. Uh, you put the reservoir there and you get a little a little extra height on top of the height that the water gets pushed up inside the reservoir. So uh, the Mount Prospect Reservoir was Brooklyn's version of the uh, the Murray Hill Reservoir. Right, th thank you. And is there anything else that um, you, um, you, you would like to address before we uh, uh, wind up the questions? Anything else you would particularly like to, to say? Well, here, here's somebody talking about how the street traffic must have been a complete nightmare, as it must have been in Lower Manhattan. Um, let's see. Were there a lot of fires in 1900? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's funny because we, New York has a really good fire department and has had a really good fire department for a long time. Um, we have a lot of firehouses. Uh, they're, they're relatively closely spaced. And the re there are two reasons for that. And the first one is, as was just mentioned, really bad traffic. And the second reason was a lot of fires. So you combine those two things and you need a lot of firehouses. Why do we have a lot of fires? Um, because 
with the exception of that handful of modern buildings, every other building had wood floors, wood joist floors, and therefore uh, was flammable. And with the exception of the minority of buildings that had electric light, everybody else was lighting their buildings using flames, using gas fire. Uh, so you combine wood buildings and gas and you have a lot of fires. Absolutely. Um, I think then I'm going to take, I'm going to uh, take, this is um, our last question, um, unless you have something else you want to address, Don, and this is from Megan Reese. She comes with a great presentation and she wonders, um, what is your, what is your main source for the image, for images, Don? Is there one particular place you go to, both for this other lectures and others you might browse for inspiration? Uh, the, the main source is the Library of Congress website, um, because if something is public domain, not only do they have it there, but they have it there in very high resolution. Uh, a lot of these photographs, uh, you know, you're seeing them scaled down for the presentation. A lot of them are really, really high resolution. They're just incredible. You can zoom in and get all sorts of detail. Uh, secondary site would be the, uh, the New York Public Library's digital collection but the, the Library of Congress is, is by far the, the best site for this kind of thing. All right, well, they, they were absolutely extraordinary and wonderful images. And we are so grateful for you for sharing them with us uh, this evening, Dawn. It really was, a, you know, it was absolutely fascinating and engrossing um, presentation. And, you know, we are, and we're so delighted, what a wonderful way to um, start our landmark lectures. And of course, we also want to take this opportunity to, uh, to thank Lisa Easton um, um, for um, curating this series. And we'll be looking forward to seeing uh, Lisa over the next few months. Um, Victoria, is there anything that you would like to say? And, and in fact, Lisa, is there anything you would like to say too? to thank Don for this great presentation. Thanks for being willing to, uh, to share your knowledge. Um, I second many of the comments that came forth. I personally enjoy your books. I, uh, I find them just easy to read, number one, but it's so informative. And I can't tell you how many times I refer back to your knowledge to uh, understand more about our building fabric in New York. So thank you for this great lecture. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And your your exhaustive knowledge. You're really a gift to the industry. And thank you so much. Really? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Yes, I mean it there weren't many questions that stumped you, John. Don, it was extremely impressive. Very, very impressive. Um, so I am going, I am going to I am now going to wind up and just if you um and thank you for the audience um, for staying with us. I'm just going to very quickly mention um, some um, upcoming uh, lectures that, uh, that you might be interested in. And uh, these would include uh, on Thursday, April 15th, the adaptive reuse of the historic tobacco warehouse in the St. Anne's warehouse um, with um, two of the architects from uh, Marvel who are responsible for that. Um, on April 20th, we have um, a lecture, Tuesday, April 20th, uh, on multi-stories, 55 antique skyscrapers. Then on April 27th, we have our next landmark e lecture, and that is material transfers, metaphor, craft, and place in contemporary architecture, and that is with Francois Astor Gollet. And I'm also going to finally, I'm just going to conclude, there are other lectures coming up, but I'll just mention the other, our other two landmark lectures. And that will be Tuesday, May 25th, and that will be uh, Norma uh, Barbaki. I'm, I'm sorry, Norma, if I have massacred your name. And on Tuesday, June 22nd, we have Felicia Mayro. Um, again, it is my great pleasure. I want to thank you, the audience, um, for attending this evening. Again, my You've asked such really excellent questions. Um, my thanks to Lisa once more and Don. You know what? What a pleasure to have you speak uh, here this evening. And really, what an extraordinary and comprehensive lecture. And here is to the book for the appearance of the past. So thank you, Don. Thank you very much. Um, good, good night to everyone. See you in a few weeks. Thank you very much. Good night. Thanks.